rip it harder, I'm the best ever I'm the most brutal and vicious and most ruthless captain there's ever been There's no one can stop me, I'm the best ever I want to sit down today and let me use the reverb to really give this the drama it deserves We have a 6 degree Kempo Karate Black Belt A Brazilian Jiu Jitsu Black Belt A 2006 International Brazilian Jiu Jitsu Federation World Champion in the Master Senior Division that was held in Brazil, by the way. A three-time Naga North American champion and a Naga world champion, plus a Naga PA champion. And guess what? It's all the same dude. So you probably thought I had like 20 guests, but let me keep going. In 1996, he won the Volaris International Karate Tournament at the black belt level. In 2004, he was inducted into the World Karate Union Hall of Fame as the most dedicated martial artist of the year. He's also an avid rock climber, mountaineer, and a fitness enthusiast. I present Jimmy Wing. What's up, Jimmy? How are you? Hey, Mike. How are you? Thanks for having me in here. No problem. We got a lot to cover today. You have Wing's Daily News, an internet news site, so you're very opinionated. Let's get right to it. We have a bunch of issues to tackle, but let's start with the UFC. Uh, fighter salaries. Flashback to UFC 158, GSP vs. Nick Diaz. The gate was 3710000 Pay-per-view buys were in the 550000 range. At $50 a pay-per-view, I think it's like 55 for high def. That's 27500000 Add in the gate and you're over $30 million bucks, not counting the merchandise sales. Yet eight fighters on the card were paid less than eight grand. Your stars did good. GSP got 400000 and Nick Diaz got two hundred flat. Is eight grand enough money to fight on the big show? No, of course, Mike. Uh, of course not. When you were reading the uh, financial statistics, I kind of actually wasn't even paying attention because in my mind, it's all irrelevant. The fact is, is that the UFC is way, way, way in the black. I even did a blog piece about this called What the UFC Pays Their Fighters is a Crying Shame. Now, if you look at the revenue that the UFC grosses to the, the payouts for the non-main event fighters, it's really, in my opinion, it, it's a travesty. These guys should be getting paid a lot more than they are. So in a sense, you look at the disparity between what the CEOs make. And we'll say the CEOs, like you could say like the CEO of Microsoft. What's the CEO's salary of Microsoft compared to the average rank and file employee? So when I use that analogy for the UFC, we'll refer, refer to the UFC as a whole as the, uh, as the CEO. The money that they're generating is in the millions compared to eight and eight for a guy to fight on the UFC. That, 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 that should be illegal. Josh Cholish, a recent UFC fighter, just took a fight in Brazil, uh, said he lost money on the UFC's Fox show. He said he's allowed three corners for each fight, but per his contract, he only gets one coach's flight, one hotel room, and the UFC covers one visa. He claims to have paid over three grand in flights, plus an additional hotel room that he had to come out of pocket for. Then he had to pay for two additional visas at 500 bucks a pop. There's licensing fees and medicals, all this without even considering his gym and trainer fees. He claims to have taken a hit between five to 10 grand. It's more profitable to fight on a local show like Locked in a Cage or XCC or uh, Matrix, am I right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I know a lot of people in the MMA industry, and I'm not going to drop any names, but I've heard that before. Guys taking fights overseas that actually have to pay money to fight into the UFC. A lot of the, the regular fans don't know. You only get two plane tickets out there and one airplane room. So let's say I have a fighter going out to Vegas. It's me, the fighter, and two corner guys. So you're going to tell me that whole team is going to stay in one room? Who's paying for the extra room? The fighter does. So it's, you know, Cholish took a lot of heat for it in, in typical Dana White fashion. Dana goes uh, goes after Cholish for speaking the truth, and, and Cholish did speak the truth. I've heard of other instances where guys lost a significant amount of money trying to fight into the UFC. But the big difference is, is yeah, you could fight in locked in a cage, you could fight in extreme cage combat, XFV, any of the any of the uh, good local promotions, but you simply don't get the name recognition that the UFC can can provide. You can become a star in the UFC. Absolutely right, like you said, name recognition. Um, Corey Hill is fighting coming up June twenty second for World Cage Fighting Championships. A friend of mine, Doug Yashinsky, is the owner. He's probably going to have to pay him a little bit extra because of his uh, name recognition from being on the UFC. Um, Corey Hill's the guy that had the uh, severely broken leg, so his name got extra bigger because of the results of his fight, but he's still a really tough guy and definitely a main eventer on the local card. Tim Williams was on The Ultimate Fighter. Just from being on The Ultimate Fighter, I bet he's going to get a little bit extra because uh, of that name recognition. You're talking about guys that were on The Ultimate Fighter and uh, 
in the UFC. Also, if the UFC is making more than 30 million for every pay-per-view and their payroll average is under 2 million, which it normally does per event, unless you're dealing with a Brock Lesnar or someone on that level, possibly an Anderson Silva, uh, I understand they have advertising and event expenses, but should the big fighters be getting paid uh, million dollar paydays yet, like boxing? Yeah, you know, it, it really depends upon which perspective you look at that from. From the perspective of the athlete, absolutely. I, I can't believe that boxers get paydays into the multiples of mil millions, tens of millions. And if, uh, you know, a main eventer might get, I don't know, maybe a million, a little bit more with pay-per-view buy rate percentages. But the, the real problem is what the guys on the um, non-televised cards are getting and the undercard. That, that's the issue at hand. I mean, you, if you look at the, the select few guys in the UFC that have become millionaires, we probably have GSP, of course, Anderson Silva. I'm sure you'd throw John Jones in there. Um, Kane is probably on his way. But for the multitude of guys that aren't in that position, how much are they generally making? I mean, the, the lifestyle of a fighter is tremendously expensive. They have to drive, unless you're in one of those, uh, you know, they do it all schools out in Vegas. Out on the East Coast, most of the fighters have to drive hours, hours per week. You know, if you look at a guy like uh, Charlie Brennerman, Chris Wing, Tom DeBlast, they're driving constantly from going from training facility to uh, training facility. And it's really hard to recoup that money when you're getting paid thousands of dollars for a fight in the UFC. It's, it's almost like, what's the point? Yeah, these guys are doing it for the love of it. I seen on Facebook that uh, Azuna Zoo was down in uh, Coconut Creek, Florida, training with American Top Team. And uh, I'm sure he's doing that with his own money. So it's a lot of dedication. Are you in favor of a union in mixed martial arts? You know, I have mixed feelings on that. Uh, I'm a union guy through and through. Uh, I worked for the Associated Press for a long time and I was a shop steward. There's upsides and downsides to unionism. I would, I would probably say as a last resort, yes, because the problem with collective bargaining is now every, essentially the bar is even for everyone. So the top fighters would be making less. The bottom fighters would be making more. I'd rather uh, subscribe to the, to the notion that the UFC kind of does these things on their own. I mean, if you read Scholish's interview, he says that the benefits that the UFC provides aren't even really that good. So it's just, it really comes down to the fans. And, and I wrote a blog post about this, this very topic. And, and one fan replied that, you know, well, the fighters have the option to go seek employment elsewhere, or do other things if that's what the pay is. And that's true, that's, that's, that's a good response. But imagine you just being on a job and your, your boss paying you the minimum that he could get away with just because he could. To turn around and blame the employee for staying on the job is kind of blaming the victim. So probably I would, I would be against a fighter's union to start with. I would just like to see the UFC step up and take care of these guys the way they should. Right, so you're, uh, you're uh, trusting good faith? To, uh, to fix the issue. Yeah, but to kind of count on Zufa to do the right thing is probably the wrong thing. And at the end of the day, I get it. It's a business. And if they start paying these guys what I'm thinking they should get paid, you know, are the fans going to shoulder the a $70 pay-per-view? That's true. And they put on a lot of uh, great things. The UFC does a lot of great things, and they're responsible for the growth of the sport. But they do a lot of stupid things, too. Uh, one of my pet peeves, one of their biggest fuck-ups has been Pride. When they bought Pride, I was a huge Pride fan. Um, that was back in the hot box days where I used to steal all the pay-per-views. I used to watch it live from Japan, and uh, I would watch all these Pride shows, and it was the best thing I ever seen. That was the first time I seen uh, The Axe Murder, Wanderlei Silva, Fedor, and uh, I watched these guys, and I was thinking at the current time, they could jump over to the UFC, and they could beat the piss out of these UFC guys. Um, a lot of people are down on Fedor now because he's retired or whatever, but in Fedor's heyday, he could have jumped over to the UFC. He would have beat Tim Silva in 30 seconds. In fact, he did. Um, he would have smashed uh, Frank Mir, he, anybody that uh, was the current UFC champion in that day. Um, let's switch it over now. Let's talk uh, Fallon Fox, who in my opinion is a dude going around fighting girls. Uh, I understand I'm supposed to be more accepting of uh, transgender bullshit because that's the way society and pop culture programs people to be. Uh, to me, it's disgusting. Me personally, not the opinion of uh, Jim Wing here. But uh, Fallon Fox, is that a dude going around beating up on chicks? You know, I, at first, I, I subscribe to basically your philosophy. It's a, it's a, biologically, he's a guy. But I actually saw her fight over the weekend and I gotta tell you I wasn't impressed it wasn't like she went out there and murked a girl she did this bizarre submission where it was basically knee on throat and tapped the chick so at this point you know I don't know what weight she's at but 
if she was like close to Rousey's weight and she fought Rousey, Rousey would just murder her. So I think it's kind of a non sequitur. It's a non-issue. She's not lighting up the world. Let her go. It's based on weight, and uh, it's incumbent upon her her opponent to step up and beat her. So no, I don't really have an issue with it because she's just, quite frankly, she doesn't strike me as being that good. Right. But two and zero. I bet you she's getting some good paydays. Just looking at her though. I mean, could you tell that she's a dude? If I didn't know, I mean, hey, no, I'm a guy, and if I saw her walking down the grocery store, I would think <laughs> it was a girl. But, but you know, when you know that. Prior to her transgender surgery, she was a guy. Yeah, you could see the the, the, the bone structure of a man, but I wouldn't know. I, I could not. If I saw her walking around the store, I would just think it was a girl with muscles. How good are you at that? I mean, can you normally spot somebody that's transgender? No, you know, and it's funny. <laughs> I know somebody who does that. We'll be out, and a guy will look at a, a, a girl and say, hey, that's a tranny, and it, it, that... I'm really worried about buying my, my, my food and my dinner and what I'm going to eat that night. I'm, I'm not worried about if the guy I'm looking at is a girl or vice versa. I, I don't care. If I didn't do this, I think it'd be a crime uh, against my listeners. But uh, do you want to play a great, uh, game of uh, Guess the Tranny? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Nothing to lose here. Guess the Tranny. Here we go. Please select the transvestite out of these three women. Woman one, woman two, woman three. Woman one is super hot. Woman two is hot. Woman three is hot. Listen, Mike, I'm 52 years old. I don't get a lot of action. I'd go out with any of those. I don't care. Uh, but if I had to guess, I'm going to say the super hot number one. She's the, number one. She's the tranny. And for the record, none of these, this is, this is a very hard question because none of Adam's apples, none of the dead giveaways. You can't see the size of hands or feet. So let's see what we got here, Jim. Correct. Jim just identified the tranny. <laughs> it was the super hot one. Excellent job. That's very tough because normally, you know, you look at them hands. If they, you see big giant hands or anything like that, you know what you're working with. Well, I'd still go out on a date with number one. She's smoking. <laughs> All right. Guess the tranny, please. Guess the tranny, please. Let's switch it over now to Nick Newell. Uh, you familiar with the name? No. Nick Newell is a 9-0 and professional fighter. He's a BJJ brown belt and a high-level Muay Thai striker. He's finished eight out of nine opponents, and he's just signed with the World Series of Fighting. That's pretty interesting because if you have a guy on the local level that's 9-0 and and finished eight out of nine opponents... That's pretty insane. That's somebody who, uh, on the East Coast here, Philadelphia in particular, New Jersey area, we'd be pulling for that guy, thinking like he's the next big thing. The interesting about, thing about Nick, though, is he has one arm. If you were a fighter, could you go 100% against a guy with one arm? Yeah, absolutely. When, when I wrestled in, uh, in high school back in the 70s, there was a kid, he had one leg. And... Uh, he was at a different weight than I was. One of my teammates had to wrestle him. But yeah, it's no, if we're under the unified rules, it's not my problem. He's got one arm. As a matter of fact, I do everything I could to take advantage of it. All right, we're going to take our first break. Got Jimmy Wing here. And when we come back after the break, we're going to get into some mountain climbing and some of the other cool shit Jimmy does. Be right back. Live June 22nd, 2013, Rocco's Pizza Ray presents World Cage Fighting Championship 6. Experience mixed martial arts live at the Kirk S. Nevin Arena in Greensburg, PA, as Caleb Ball meets UFC veteran Corey Hill in a showdown for the WCC title. This card is stacked and tickets start at just $35. Log on to www.wccmma.com to buy your seats and be there live. For more information, call 570-778-6215. Rocco's Pizzeria, the pound-for-pound kings of pizza, presents World Cage Fighting Championship 6, live June 22nd. Broadcasting live from the penthouse atop Center City's largest skyscraper scraper. Or, better yet, live from a converted tool shed in Levittown, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. It's Sit Down Radio with your host, Mike Bicky. Bicky. Alright, we're back with Jimmy Wing. 
So let's talk about uh, mountain climbing. Is that something that you uh, started taking up recently or have you been doing that for a while? No, I've only been climbing a little over two years, so I'm a, I'm a rookie climber. Okay. In December of 2011, you successfully summited the tallest mountain in the Northeast, which is Mount Washington. How dangerous is mountain climbing, really? It's incredibly dangerous, Mike. And when I had summited, the first time I summited Mount Washington, I was with a guide. That's a professional climber. They're, those are like the black belts of climbing. They're good enough that they'll take clients out and you know they make sure that nothing bad happens to the client. So I worked with a guide on the December climb and uh, it was in December on Mount Washington. So then just in typical Jim Wing fashion, I assumed that I could just summit it solo and when you uh, when you solo summit a mountain that's pretty much the uh the epitome of badassness so i went back in february and attempted a, a, a winter solo uh, summit attempt but since i lack experience i didn't know that mount washington is significantly different in february than december and the climb was absolutely hellacious i'm, I'm really really lucky i didn't die up there a guy had died the month before I was up there. A guy died the, uh, the month after I was there. And that just this last year, I think four people died up there. All from falls? Yeah, multiple things. One, um, you know, you realize when you're on the top of a mountain, there's no police tape. There's no Mr. Policeman telling you it's not safe. Uh, towards the summit of Mount Washington, you have to hike at the lip of this ravine. They call it the head wall. It's an 800 foot straight uh, drop. And when you climb in the winter time, it gets dark at, at around 4.30, so you're under a huge narrow window. You have to be able to climb and get do the down climb before it gets dark or you're stranded up there. Uh, nobody knows what happened to the guy, but he was wandering around up there in the dark and slid down that head wall, fell 800 feet to his death. You can, you can die from exposure up there. When I was doing the climb in February, it, 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 the conditions were, it was like out of the movie Ice Station Zebra. I had never experienced anything like that. It was negative 50 degrees. It was so cold, in fact, I spit. My spit froze before it could even hit my sleeve. I've never, and the winds were negative, uh, they, the winds were 90 miles an hour. So what happens is if uh, something as simple as a broken ankle can get you killed because it is impossible to get off a mountain in those conditions when you're on your own with something, a, a, a twisted knee, a twisted ankle, you're stuck there. You, you just die from exposure. No uh, cell phone signal or anything like that? No, the cell phone doesn't work up there. And in fact, what had happened is um, before I had crested what is called tree line, you're in the lee of the mountain, so it was actually pretty nice, and I was sweating profusely, and I didn't know that, so I took the cell phone out just to text the people that were waiting for me at the base of the mountain to do a time check-in, and the sweat had frozen on the phone. It was it was frozen solid. I, I couldn't turn the phone on. You ever see any uh, crazy wildlife up there, like goats and shit? No, no, I, no. <laughs> above... On Mount Washington, there's really nothing up there above uh, 5,000 feet, so uh, no, I've not seen anything like that. I've not seen the abominable snowman or anything. No Yetis? You believe in the Yeti? No. No, I don't believe in <laughs> UFOs. I don't believe in, in Yetis. And you know, we're talking about climbing. I'm getting uh, geared up, ready to do my biggest climb yet, and that'll be Mount Shuksan out in the uh, Cascades. Those are like the American Swiss Alps. So that'll be the biggest climb for me. And um, I started a fundraising campaign on this website called supportlocalstuff.com. Mm -hmm. If you go there, you can, uh, I'll have an associated blog article uh, linked to it, but it's like uh, gofundme.com. People can donate to the climb. Uh, Mount Shuksan is a technical climb. It's not, Mount Washington is, is essentially, it's a, it's a hike on steroids in the worst conditions known to man. Mount Shuksan is kind of like that, but it's more of a technical climb. It's, it's a, it's a two-day climb. One day we're going to have to sleep on the mountain. There's a lot of crevasse work. So if you go to uh, supportlocalstuff.com forward slash mountain climb, that's my fundraising campaign. You can uh, help contribute so I can fund this expedition. And uh, based on the amount that you donate, I'm taking sponsorships. I'm going to do an M like the MMA model. I'll have a, a, a climb banner. So if you donate, anyone who donates to the campaign will have their name listed on the banner. Anyone who donates $100 or more can have their company logo. And if you buy the center of the banner, then you get the center of the banner. I'll have a picture taken at the summit and then extensive media coverage on the way up and down of the climb. So that's, that's the next adventure that I'm planning. Hopefully that happens in September. So for me, that'll be one more step, which my ultimate goal is to getting out to Mount Everest. 
So what's your plan if that rope ever breaks? Is there a uh, backup to your backup? You know, it's, it's interesting, Mike. Usually I don't work with a backup rope and you're supposed to. So the backup plan is basically to die. Um, <laughs> early, early in my climb experiences, you know, the, the edge of the cliff is very sharp. So I put a piece of canvas down to keep the climbing rope from getting sawed in half. Climbing ropes under tension cut very easy. Right. And I was doing like one of my first training ascents and I was about 10, 10 feet up, 10 feet below the lip. And I could see that the rope had popped off the edge protection and gone right into a groove of two pieces of rock. And if that rope had sliced in half, it would have been about 115 feet straight down. And the fall there is ugly. It's not like 120 feet down onto sand. There's jagged rocks. There's a lip I would have smashed into that, cartwheeled off into space. So it just would have been ugly. There's, there's no plan B. Plan B is to die. All right, let's switch it over now. Kempo Karate is the same foundation that Chuck Liddell used, and he was extremely successful. Uh, what is so effective in MMA about Kempo Karate compared to other striking forms? You know, it's interesting, Mike, because I started as a Kempo stylist before uh, I had made, uh, even heard of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And at the time, when grappling began to explode, People begin to mock karate. It's stupid. It doesn't work. It's gay. It's it's retarded. And it, in a sense, I almost became embarrassed to tell people that I trained in karate. And then when Lyota Mishida came onto the scene and he poured it in really effective karate, I think the other high-level martial artists began to see that, holy shit, you know, it's not about doing the katas, but the fundamental strikes in any of the Eastern martial arts, Kempo, Taekwondo, Tang Soo Do, they're all very effective. If you look at um, Belfort's knockout, the spinning heel kick, and then the week before that, uh, it was Belfort, and then um, Kane just pulled it off, or, yep. or, or, or JDS. JDS. So I think what's happening in MMA, you're seeing the evolution. The, 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 the Gracies brought the jiu-jitsu in, then all the fighters became very, very proficient in, in jiu-jitsu. Then wrestling was the next skill that all the fighters became very, very good at, and then finally, you know, American boxing. Some of the guys, like I think Frankie Edgar and GSP, their boxing skills are at pro level. Finally, I think the last piece of the puzzle is you're seeing many of the traditional karate techniques uh, are being shown to be very, very effective in MMA. Spin kicks are starting to land like every week. Um, Uriah Hall landed it on the Ultimate Fighter. That blew people away, and that was the first one we've seen in a very long time in a major promotion. Was Kempo Karate your first uh, martial art that you learned? Yeah. As When I was in high school, I would study for a few months here and a, and a few months there. So, you know, you're going back to like 75, 76, 77. It wasn't like today. There was virtually no martial arts schools of any type around. I mean, there was no grappling. The only grappling was, was you know, high school wrestling, college wrestling, or judo. So, Kempo was the first formal system that I settled down to and studied consistently and, and worked my three, way through the, uh, the ranking system. How long did it take you to get your black belt in Kempo? In, 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 in Kempo, it, it was pretty quick. It was about two years. So what are some of the techniques that you've seen in your history in Kempo that you've watched Chuck Liddell use? I watched Chuck one time and he mentioned something about uh, Kempo fighters actually turn the fist when they punch. Is that correct? Yeah, it's called corkscrewing a punch. You add rotational energy to the punch. And if you were to go to a karate school, that's the, you, you, the first night, first lesson. That's what they teach you. And what happens is it's not so much the discrete karate techniques. It's the it's the it's a punch technique fundamental. How to how to get rotation with your fist. How to get uh, hip rotation in and drive from your foot. These are all fundamentals that are found in karate that I think a lot of guys are starting to finally uh, integrate into MMA. Okay, so as the father of Chris Redline Wing, an MMA fighter, you willingly put your son in a cage, you train him for his fights. For those of us that aren't a season in the true dangers of martial arts as you are, are you more focused on the competition aspect of Chris fighting or are you more in father mode hoping he doesn't get hurt? Early in his career, it was father mode. It, I would get really, really distraught um, before the fights, but probably after his third or his fourth pro fight, I began to calm down and focus more on the task at hand, which was the dynamics of the fight. So, you know, his last few fights, I've been pretty calm. The ones before that, I was really distraught. 
And you and uh, Chris have been over to Brazil uh, to train jiu-jitsu, is that right? Yeah, we were there twice, uh, 2006 when I uh, won the Master Seniors, and then I think we went back uh, the, the following year to, to train jiu-jitsu. So what's next for Chris? Well, right now he's on hiatus. He started a company that he's calling Redline Athletics Nutritional Compounds. He does, you know, customized meal programs for people. Um, helping them get into shape. He's definitely gonna fight again. The the, um, the issue is just when. He's young, he's, he's gonna turn 25 next month, so we have plenty of time. He had 11 amateur fights, he's got eight, eight pro fights. But you know, when we were speaking before the interview, I, I don't want Chris to end up one of these guys that's seven or eight years from now fighting on the local circuit for four and four because he's got to pay his rent or something like that. Right. So when Chris kind of implied to me that he was going to take a break to start his own company as a dad, when am I supposed to tell him, no, you can't hustle, I, I want you to be a, an MMA rat and let's pin our... You know, I'm not saying that, you know, ultimately Chris can't make it to the big show, but the odds of any fighter making it to the UFC and then once getting there are, are remote. So I'm glad that he's working on a, on a plan B right now. And then when he gets back to fighting, you know, hopefully he, he starts enjoying it. I can't speak for Chris, you know. I just know that his last couple of fights, I, I thought he could have done better. And I just think there was so much pressure on you have to perform well because you have to have a good record to get into the UFC. What a lot of fans don't realize is there is a lot of guys on the local circuit that have 500 records or sub-500 records that are tough as shit. Absolutely. There are no easy fights anymore at the local level. And everybody's pushing because you don't want to get a couple losses on your record and uh, feel like you're just completely out of the radar of the UFC. Uh, Bellator as well. Bellator has universally been recognized as number two for a while. And uh, the Bellator fighters are coming in with crazy records, 16 and 2, things along those lines. You get five or six losses, you really got to hustle to get yourself back up onto that plateau. But then there's guys that have been around for a while. I, I'm not sure Mark Hunt's exact record, but I believe it wasn't that great. No, um, it was probably close to 500. Yeah. But then again, he's Mark Hunt. He's a K1 world champion. He hits hard as shit. And uh, I don't know if you've seen what he did to Stefan Struve's jaw. Yeah. My God, there was a fracture like going from his chin to his mustache. So Chris Redline Wing, uh, good dude. I actually asked him uh, what I should uh, do to get a, cu a couple pounds off. He said eat more chicken. <laughs> I went to Popeye's, which is probably not what he meant. <laughs> no, he did not mean fried chicken. <laughs> But uh, did Chris naturally want to train martial arts, or did you kind of guide him toward it? Well, we had all we had uh, we were in the Valari system, a Kempo at the time. So it was me, my daughter, and Chris. We all trained together and had been competing for years. So Chris kind of was raised in a martial arts environment. He started training in uh, in Kempo when he was four and a half. So that's pretty much. He's only known a life of. Uh, you know, martial arts and fitness. So if he was training, you know, even when we train for the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu tournaments, we just don't, you know, roll a couple of times at our gym and then go into a tournament. There's a whole, it's a training camp to prepare for a tournament. So he's, he's always been involved in the martial arts and he, and he took that work ethic, you know, with him into his adult life. I seen a picture of your daughter with Chris on Chris's Facebook. Um, she's got these cut arms. She's in great shape. Uh, how come she never got in the cage? She actually, Mike, that's a good question. Um, when she was a teenager, we're going back to the mid-90s, she actually did full contact amateur kickboxing for Lou Neglia. She fought for uh, Lou Neglia probably five or six times when he did the kickboxing shows out in the Vanderbilt, Long Island. Right. And we did a couple of fights at, they would do them at um, Ray Longo's gym out in Long Island as well. So no, she's got competitive experience as well. Um, Chris had a really tough fight at the last Locked in the Cage, or two Locked in the Cages ago against Shedrick Alexander. Some thought Chris won, others had Shedrick. Uh, what were your thoughts on the fight? You know, I, I, I like, uh, I like Sheddy a lot, and I really enjoy uh, hyping the fights. You know, and here's the thing with a split decision. When I'm with my fighters and we're in the I, I'm always honest with the guys. If we lose a round, I tell them you lost that round. If you know that a split decision is coming, and if you're a good trainer, you just know the score in your head, you know it's gonna come down to a split. I tell my fighters to be mentally prepared for the screw job. 
because you know you're going to get screwed. One of those fighters is going to get shafted on a split. Right. Nobody ever complains when they win the split. Everybody always complains, complains when they lose the split. So do I think Chris won? It really doesn't matter. The judges think that he won, and, and that's the way it goes. It was it was a close fight, and it really depends upon who you ask. If you ask anyone from Goodridge's camp, they'll say he won. Anyone from our camp will say we won. We're going to come back, and we're going to talk about Wings MMA, which is one of the biggest mixed martial arts schools in the whole tri-state area. We're going to take a break, and we'll be right back with Jimmy Wing. Casting live from the penthouse atop Center City's largest skyscraper scraper. Or better yet, live from a converted tool shed in Levittown, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. It's Sit Down Radio with your host, Mike Bicky. Bicky. Live June 22nd, 2013, Rocco's Pizza Ray presents World Cage Fighting Championship 6. Experience mixed martial arts live at the Kirk S. Nevin Arena in Greensburg, PA, as Caleb Ball meets UFC veteran Corey Hill in a showdown for the WCC title. This card is stacked and tickets start at just $35. Log on to www.wccmma.com to buy your seats and be there live. For more information, call 570-778-6215. Rocco's Pizzeria, the pound-for-pound kings of pizza, presents World Cage Fighting Championship 6, live June 22nd. We are back with Jim Wing, who can spot a transvestite a mile away. Let's talk about Wings MMA, your school in Trevos. You have tons of training bags. You got them Dollamore mats. Am I saying that right? Dollamore? Yep, you got it. 40 feet of MMA cage panels, 20 foot of uh, training ring. Uh, the place is completely state of the art, and it's obvious that it was built by a martial artist, not a corporation trying to cash in on the popularity of uh, MMA. Is that your baby? Yeah, yeah. We uh, we designed it from the ground up to kind of teach the programs that we had in mind. So, you know, we knew that we would be teaching multiple programs, fitness, um, uh, karate and MMA and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. So the uh, the gym was set up like an Omni gym. I mean, we have uh, we have a, an elevated MMA cage. There's nights where we'll, we will be running two classes at the same time. We have a, we have enough space to do that. What are some of the ways that martial arts schools and coaches can go wrong in terms of training fighters to get in a cage? Well, I think we're finally towards the end of that massive explosion of everybody opening up an MMA gym. And I can tell this by the way my phone rings. Three years ago, if there was a UFC on a Saturday, my phone would ring all the way through the following Wednesday. Do you teach MMA? Do you teach MMA? Do you teach MMA? (laughs) I'd even have parents calling. They want an MMA for their children. That doesn't happen anymore. So I think what's happening is during that period, you had every Tom, Dick, and Harry opening up an MMA school. I even knew guys. I didn't know them personally, but there was this crew around. I'm just not going to mention their name. They went from being Joe Smith Karate to Joe Smith MMA and had zero credentials to teach any of that. What I did is when I saw the landscape beginning to change, um, I began to train in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I've never been in a situation where I've had to hire an outside instructor to teach our classes. All of our instructors, we, we train from white belts up through the ranks. So what's happening now is a lot of those littler schools are dying out and they're, and they're you know, they're just vanishing. So I think what's happening, like when, when Chris first started in MMA, there was only two MMA shows that you could get amateurs on. One was New Breed Fighters and the other was uh, Asylum Fight League. And it's not the fight of the promotions. Uh, the coach can claim anything. These kids would go in there and within seconds you could tell that they were woefully underprepared to be in there. I mean, I've seen corner guys, I mean, absolutely absolutely buffoonish, not knowing how to tape their fighters' hands, <laughs> not having well. the most the, the, pre- the, the requisite cornering tools like uh, an end swell or a spit bucket, or they go up there, listen, everybody makes mistakes, every corner guy does, but to not even know that you should bring water for your fighter, those schools I think are finally, thank God, you know, falling by the wayside. So the level of the the, of the amateurs coming up now are, is much better. They're being trained by much better schools now. So the overall, I think the quality of the training is better. 
you know, so it's kind of a, a verbose answer to your question. The problem was is unqualified instructors that are desperate to say that they have MMA fighters, you know, they'll have a kid training for a month and it's like, hey, Mikey, you want to do an MMA fight? And the poor kid goes out there and he gets slaughtered. So we're, uh, at least I'm seeing less and less of that. The schools that are around now are really uh, pretty much qualified to, to teach what they, uh, they say they do. I've seen a couple fights where um, on the amateur level where someone will be completely outclassed by uh, a, a grappler or somebody with uh, serious wrestling, amateur wrestling credentials. Now with the amateur rules um, coming into effect, are you in favor of the ground and pound on the ground uh, after three fights, I believe? Yeah, no, absolutely not. And here's why. Um, I like the way New Jersey... Um, has the amateur program set up. First off, I Nick Lembo is just an amazing guy and he was instrumental in, in writing the unified rules. Greg Serbout in PA runs a really outstanding uh, commission as well. And the rationale, my, uh, my understanding, the rationale behind implementing ground and pound after say three fights is to prepare these kids ultimately for the pro ranks. So if you go into any one of these MMA forums, these, these dopes will say, oh, well, how, how are you supposed to fight at a pro level if you're not in an environment where you're used to getting you know, punched in the head when you're on the ground? Because on amateur rules, if the fight goes to the ground, neither fighter can strike the other one in the head and it forces it to be now a jujitsu match. I think that's the way it should be. These kids are amateurs. They shouldn't be getting elbowed in the face. They shouldn't be getting punched in the face while they're on the ground. They should be working their defensive jujitsu skills to prepare them for the pro ranks. It's the trainer's responsibility. Now, when you get to say a kid like, say, a Pat Sabatini, who's probably at the very end of his amateur career. I know that when he's training down at Brazen Boxing, they're going full-blown pro rules, punches to the face. That's where it's done. That's where you prepare these kids, in my opinion, for ground and pound in the pro ranks is in the gym. It shouldn't be happening in the cage. You know, I, I got a, uh, a press pass from my blog and I was covering an event for XFE. And I, I've, I've gotten many press passes before, but at this event, I was literally a cage side. When I, when I corner a fighter, a corner guy is usually three to four feet away from the cage. This one, I was literally, my nose was at the cage mesh. And Mike, you can't believe the impact of these blows when these kids are punching each other. I mean, just to the body. I mean, the kid gets mounted, he's not allowed to punch the other kid in the head, so he was just teeing off on his ribs. And it sounded like Rocky Balboa when he was hitting that side of beef in, in the movie Rocky. Right. I can't imagine this kid is an amateur and he's getting punched in the face like that. Yeah, so no, I don't ag I don't agree with that at all. I think it's a it's a move in the wrong direction. I think if you're in a good camp, your training sessions, when you're ready for it, should include full pro rules, but definitely not at the amateur level. I'd maybe double it, uh, my opinion, maybe six or more. Because some of these guys are studs. Uh, Ryan Kafaro, uh, the kid's a stud. He's going to be an excellent pro. Beck Balat, Bakhti Beck from Rocco. I mean, that dude's an animal. Awesome on the ground. Um, and like you said, Pat Sabatini. Well, you know, it's it's a good point because if you go, you know, uh, my son Chris trains at uh, AMA Fight Club in Whippany, New Jersey with Mike Constantino. And they have top of world-class guys there, UFC guys, the Millers, Charlie Brenneman. If you ever watch the way Mike structures his training sessions with his fighters, he comes from an Eastern martial arts background. He was a karate instructor first. So his, his practice sessions, even with the pros, are very structured. Sometimes it might be wall fighting. He does a three-man drill where, where two guys are on the ground, one guy's got boxing gloves, one guy's got MMA gloves. The MMA guy, uh, glove guy is on his back. The boxing glove guy is in his guard. He's throwing ground and pound with boxing gloves. The bottom guy is, is essentially doing defensive jujitsu and stuff. So you can have a training practice that's intelligently structured the way Constantino does that will simulate a live fight ground and pound where it's not in a cage where it's live. So I think it should be done in the training room and, and, and not live. And when they're pros, they're pros. Amateurs are amateurs. I think it's just a way for to, to make the sport, sport even, even more... Uh, the bloodlust factor for the fans. I mean, you're talking about some amateur kid going in there. He gets mounted. 
yeah, maybe he's got three fights, four fights, and now he's getting his, his, the shit kicked out of him. He's getting punched in the head. It's just, it's just, no, nah, I don't like it. I don't even like it really at the pro level. <laughs> when you see a guy get mounted, I don't find anything sporting about that position. And a lot of these refs take heat. Oh, you stopped the fight too early. You stopped the fight too early. Well, exactly how many more punches should that guy had gotten in the head before the fight was stopped? That is a really really dangerous position. You're talking about a grown ass man essentially sitting on top of you while you're semi helpless and punching you in your head. It's a, it's the worst position you can be in in MMA and in Jiu Jitsu as well. So I don't know that we need to add the uh, additional dynamic of letting amateurs punch each other in the head. I uh, get the opportunity a lot to meet a lot of these fighters and um a lot of times I'm, I'm sitting cage side and I'm looking around. I'll see somebody with like a beer standing up, yelling when somebody's on the ground, getting like uh, bound, battered, ground and pounded. And uh, I'm like you. I don't like to see the fighters take too much unnecessary damage, especially when you met the guy right before the event started and the guy's asking you about your family and how is everything. And then the guy's on his back getting pummeled and you see somebody with a beer yelling like, you know, the, the always the uh, intelligent fuck them up or you know one, one of those comments from the crowd. So definitely, uh, I definitely don't like to see people um, get hurt in a cage. Uh, a lot of these guys are are very very nice people. Um, I did uh, a lot of music, a lot of hip hop um, before I started getting into MMA, and I worked with a lot of these guys. And a lot of these guys would talk tough, and they were dickheads. But they were hip hop artists. All they do is they talk, they rap into a microphone, and they make up shit about things they really don't do. Here's these martial artists that can literally kick my ass, and they're the nicest people. They play with my son. Uh, you know, they ask how your family is. I do the same. Uh, very respectable, very good people. There's not too many dicks in the uh, martial arts business. Very nice people. So when somebody's caught in a deep arm bar or something like that, if the ref stops it, Maybe they're pissed. Uh, usually they're pissed after the fight. Their coaches are pissed, but uh, I'm not really pissed because I don't want to see somebody um, take a cracked arm or, uh, you know, even if you snap the caps on, uh, they can't get into a uh, cage and do what they love to do for another six months. I think it just sucks uh, when somebody stops from doing what they're doing for the sake of the fans or for the sake of a bad referee not stopping it. Yeah, you know, it's a good point, Mike, because... You know, I'm not I'm not saying that to be a fan of a sport, you have to be able to do that sport. Like, if I'm a football fan, does that mean I have to go out and play football? Mm -hmm. But when you see, uh, you know, the amount of... Th and I'm like you, I don't know that I've ever met... I met a lot of coaches I couldn't stand. But uh, the fighters are all pretty much quiet, soft-spoken guys. The life of an MMA fighter is no joke. It's training constantly. They have to train in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu boxing, wrestling, strength and conditioning, and it just goes on day after day after day. And then they go in there and in the cage and then have a bunch of imbeciles sitting in the stands that like, why don't we just throw pointed sticks in there as well and have them try to stab <laughs> each other. I mean, it's supposed to be a sport and it's a really violent sport. And the referee's job is to help the pro to protect the fighter. Any, any true fighter, should be willing to fight literally. Uh, hey, you know, your arm's hanging off by a tendon, yeah, I'm good to go. That's the attitude of a fighter. You can't train that. That should be the intrinsic core value of a fighter. I will continue fighting, period. It is the referee's job to be the buffer between that mentality and something bad happening, and the ref should absolutely jump in and stop that. And a well-educated fan, and you know, I've written about it in the past, and it's not a blanket in state, uh, indictment against all MMA fans, but I think across the board, out of all sports fans, MMA fans tend to be the dumbest when it comes to being educated about their sport. You know, the, the geniuses on the end are the baseball fans. They know everything. They know they have the history of their sport. They know batters all the way back to the 30s. The MMA fighters not that well educated, so to them, they, they want to see a guy. I mean, have you, Mike, have, and I don't mean this to patronize you, have you ever been fucking knocked out? It's not fun. I mean, you, you, you don't know where you are. I, I, I've never fought MMA, will never fight MMA, I'm too old, but in karate, I have been knocked out. Just Queen. a couple of times sparring, full contact sparring. And it's scary for three days. You really know that there's something wrong with you. So I don't, I don't know that I'm totally comfortable. Like when, uh, when you see a really pretty knockout, there's almost an art involved in it. The setup, the execution, and throwing a punch so perfectly 
that you can turn somebody's lights out. There's a certain majesty involved with that. But then in MMA, what makes me very uncomfortable, when you go past that point now and you're allowed to jump on the guy and continue beating the shit out of a guy who's nearly unconscious anyway, you have to, you have to kind of temper you know, how you feel about a situation like that, and that's why we need the ref stopping the fights. In my opinion, there's no such thing as a quick stoppage. If that ref is even thinking if he should be stopping the fight, then the fight should be stopped. What about the crazy shit? Uh, there was a promotion in Jersey. Um, they actually lowered uh, the, the outer circle of their cage. Yama. Yama. Yeah. And Pat Smith fought uh, Tank Abbott, I want to say, or somebody like that, an old school UFC yeah. guy. So uh, that's something, if you back up, you can actually lose the fight because you didn't anticipate the uh, the drop in the floor or whatever. So it seems like uh, some of these companies want to capitalize by making it even more dangerous. In fact, uh, I just heard that there is a an organization in Russia. They do two against three MMA fights all at once. That's not a, a sport. That's a, it's a, it's a riot, pretty much. Yeah, it's a gang fight, and like there's that retarded, it's called XARM, where they take arm wrestlers and they tie their two hands together. <laughs> That's insane. You're arm wrestling and punching each other in the head at the time. And you need to ask yourself, if you live in a society that, that kind of condones that kind of activity, we're only one step away from where the Romans were when they would just let lions loose on people to be ripped to ripped, ripped pieces alive. MMA is supposed to be a sport between two trained athletes. It, it's not a blood sport. It was never meant to be a blood sport. So when these promotions come in with their, their new angle to try to, to try to pique the fascination of Americans, it's definitely a step back in the, in the wrong direction. I think MMA, you won't even recognize it five and ten years from now because guys like GSP and, and the Frankie Eggers are just such consummate athletes. They're, they're becoming technically much better. So hopefully the, these organizations like XARM and that, that, that outfit in Russia that you were just talking about, they just blow, blow, uh, blow, uh, blow away. Okay, right now we're looking at, uh, it says Extreme Russian MMA taken to a different level. Uh, this is Russian MMA two on two. Looks like they're about to fight in the uh, the old American Gladiators course. Yeah, that's what I thought. It looks like a set from the American Gladiators. And, and, and they're wearing headgears. They're wearing boxing headgears. Always got to be careful when you're fighting two on two on a fucking jungle gym. Apparently, head kicks are legal on the ground, though, Jim. Yeah, but it. it this is actually pretty cool. I, I like this. <laughs> Never mind. Take, forget everything I just said. Oh, oh this guy did a double leg, and the other guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like this. We should have this and that in this. <laughs> this is fantastic. So you are in favor of Russia? <laughs> oh, I like this. I want to buy a ticket. Ryan Kerwin, a friend, you need to do this. <laughs> Look at that. That was a beatdown. That wasn't even like. <laughs> <laughs> Only in Russia. Look at that. <laughs> With no leg gear. <laughs> oh, I like the red, <laughs> the red cross. Wow, oh, Violent. oh my God! Oh, this is terrible. <laughs> this is just. <laughs> this should be outlawed. <laughs> this is. I I don't know what to make of this. I wonder what the uh, the purpose of the course is though. Is, <laughs> do you have to get something, or is there a goal? Or... To not die. Yeah, this dude looks. <laughs> to not get something. suplexed off a five foot wall. <laughs> Russian MMA. So martial arts practitioners evolve as long as they continue to practice. Could you go back and kick Jim Wing's ass from 10 years ago? You know, that's weird, Mike, because uh, that's one of my favorite personal... Yeah, I, if I went back, you know, it was, it's a little ironic. When I was in my mid-40s, I was dreading that big 5-0. And when you hit 45, you know that you're knocking at the door 50. It's, if you're a man and you're 45 and you're listening, you're 50, okay? But I have to tell you, my 50s have been the absolute best years of my life, even physically. If I got into a time machine and went back and fought the gym wing that was competing in judo when he was 20, I would beat that kid's ass. <laughs> so if you were 20 again, will we see uh, Jimmy Wing in a cage, knowing what you know now? No. No. You know, a lot of guys will talk shit, oh yeah, I do MMA, no. Getting... Getting kicked in the head and knocked out or punched with those little four ounce gloves? No, I, I, I wouldn't be doing MMA if I was 20. Your BJJ black belt, um, 
And that's a huge accomplishment. There's people that spend years and years and years, and they can't. Uh, they work their way all the way up to brown. They can't get over that threshold and get that black belt. Uh, let's talk about your black belt. Who's it under? Uh, Jukal. Okay, can you tell us a little bit about him and um, how you got linked up with him? Yeah, Jukal is, um, he's a, I believe he's a fourth degree or a third degree black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. He's a Carlos, uh, Carlos Gracie Jr. Uh, uh, black belt. So his lineage goes right back to the, you know, close to the top of the family tree in Brazil. My first, uh, ironically, my first Jiu Jitsu stru- instructor was Tom McGonigal when he had, um, the system. The system, yeah, in, in Bristol. I, I trained with Tom for maybe a year or two years. Uh, Tom, kind of his mentor, I don't know if the word instructor is, is accurate, but he trained with Marco Santos. So I, uh, I was training at Bristol Karate Club for only one day a week on Fridays because that was my schedule. I would drive all the way from New Jersey, take a one hour class, and that's all I would do was one day a week so then I had the opportunity to go in and start training with Marco Santos so I would do the commute into New York City uh, generally uh, once or twice a month to New York and and train with Marcos and then at at one point began to take Chris in with me. Um, Jucal had just uh, immigrated from Brazil to um, Marco Santos' school and he was teaching there. It was there that I I began taking a lot of private lessons with Jucal and then my good fortune is when he, he left uh, Marco Santos, he started uh, training uh, people in New Jersey. So he was very, very close to where I live. So I've been with Jukau. I made my uh, purple belt underneath Jukau and I've been with him. I was trying to remember this the other day. I, I don't know, five or six years at least by now, maybe more. I don't know. Okay. Um, what makes you continue to compete? Because you're still active in Naga and uh, other BJJ tournaments, right? Yeah, it's 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 funny, Mike, because I was talking to a really good friend of mine, and um, I wanted to compete in the the Naga Worlds this last time around. And she's like, Jim, you know, kind of like, what is the point of you just continuing to to compete and just just you know win more titles? But you know, every time I get on the mat and I roll, I'm just a very competitive guy. And it's not me versus you. It's me versus myself. I'm always looking to bring out the best gym wing. So to me, every time I go to a gym and I'm rolling, it's like, what's the point of rolling? It's got to be to prove myself, to challenge myself and to test myself. So yeah, I just love to compete. And uh, right now I'm involved. I'm going through Naga's uh, apprentice refereeing program. So I won't be competing while I'm focusing on learning how to ref matches because it's a completely different dynamic. And I got to tell you that uh, when I when I first started competing in jiu-jitsu, it was in the over 40 division. And there were sometimes there would be just like me and one guy. There's a lot of studs coming up from, uh, you know, in that over 40 division. There's a lot of animals that are in that masters over 30 division. And I'll tell you, any guys that are out there in 10 years from now, if you're in your 30s now and you're doing the masters, these guys are going to be absolutely insane by the time they get to the director's division over 40. There's a guy, he trains at Balance. I competed against him. His name is Ronnie Wiest. And Ronnie, if I'm mispronouncing your last name, uh, let me know. Ronnie's 42 years old. Mike, on a good week, I might do three jujitsu sessions, okay? Because I'm doing <laughs> other things as well. I like the role for me, three days. Ronnie will do three in a day. I see his Facebook status is constantly. Yeah, and he's over 40, and he fucks dudes up. Yeah. The guys over 40 are absolute beasts. There's a guy that I compete against all the time, Neil Kegstra. He's 57 years old. He's a retired cop, and the guy is tough as nails. Sometimes Neil wins, sometimes he loses, but Neil's point of view is he doesn't give a shit who he goes against, he'll just roll. So there's a lot of good guys now at that over 30, over 40, and over 50 division. The level of competition in jiu-jitsu is getting very, very good. And if you guys are out there rolling now, you better you better step up your game and get out of your gyms and start challenging yourself with better guys because the level of jiu-jitsu is getting crazy. Would you ever have any interest in uh, being an MMA referee? Bill you Bookwald know, or just a dinner? Yeah, I actually contacted Nick Lembo um, and asked him what the process was to become um, a New Jersey MMA referee. And he said that he would keep me in mind. There's no openings right now. Um, you know, I, I've never refed an MMA match, but... I might be speaking out of turn. It can't be as hard as refing a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu match. You know, you're in the cage. You keep an eye on things. You're not scoring points. Uh, refing 
Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is incredibly difficult. It's one of the hardest things I've, I've ever had to do. But yeah, if the opportunity came, I'd love to, uh, I'd love to uh, ref. I, I, I reached out to somebody in PA and they said that wouldn't happen because I run a school out here and Serb wouldn't allow that. It's a conflict of interest. Right. So it kind of only leaves New Jersey. I mean, that's, you know, right next door. So I'm not going to go out to any other state to, to, to ref. I mean, Naga does tournaments all over the world. I'll be refing uh, Virginia Beach, then I'll be refing um, Wildwood, and then a week later in Connecticut. And if I get good enough, there's potential to travel all over the world. Germany, Hawaii, they do. They did a, a tournament in Monaco, and so they're growing. So right now, my uh, officiating emphasis is really on on refereeing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, but definitely, if, if Nick Lembo called me and said, hey, listen, we have an opening for you to be a shadow official or something like that, I'd definitely do it. When's the last time you were really pushed to your limits by an obnoxious jerk-off in public? <laughs> <laughs> Where you right. wanted to use your BJJ? Yeah, or? just a few. All right, it's, I'll try to make it quick. I had a, a close friend who was going through a really ugly divorce at the time, so I said, "Okay, Sally, listen. There's a local bar I go to. It's kind of quiet. Let's go there." Now, Mike, when I go to, I like dump bars, dive bars. Now, listen, I don't want to hang out in a place where you're going to get hit by a stray bullet or something like that. But I like to hang out, like. Like a lot of people, you know, they talk about uh, Kensington, Kensington. Uh, when Chris was fighting down there, I walked into some local bar. I just, I felt great. I like bars like that. So anyway, I bring my friend to a bar like this and we're sitting at the corner and I hear all this screaming and yelling and this big biker dude, he was like stereotype, biker vest, big pot belly, no shirt on. Right. He charges down the bar and he grabs some woman by her hair. She had long hair and he, and he wrapped his fist her hair around his fist so she couldn't get away and he cocks a punch to go to just jack her up what the fuck is that about <laughs> that's what i said and it happened mike it was lightning fast like this this fat fuck moved like lightning <laughs> he wanted to beat this chick down so i grabbed him kind of wrestle him to the ground and i had been doing jujitsu not that long and it was a perfect scenario for jujitsu. It could have been really bad for me. He was all by himself, so I didn't have to worry about his buddies kicking this curb stomp at me while I'm trying to you know, work with this guy. Right. I mounted him and I got the hooks in really deep and was able to control him. And he you know, he was freaking out and I'm like, his name was Max. I'm like, look, Max, if I let you up, are you gonna hurt me? He's like, oh, I'm gonna kill you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna fucking kill everyone in here. So I just held him down. <laughs> That's not gonna get you out of mount, Max. And told, he just finally got so tired and he wouldn't stop. So then I, I, I slipped in um, a Nogi Ezekiel choke, and he had never been choked in his life, and then he had had enough. When I let him up, he was just really reasonable. So that was the only situation, I mean, the worst situation I've had to use jujitsu in. But it could have been a lot worse. If he had had a couple of friends, I don't know that it would have, I, I think that the girl just would have gotten beaten up. I would have got, everyone would have gotten beaten up. Well, it turns out, <laughs> for sure, they lived in the apartment above the bar. And this was commonplace for these two to get get the scrapping up in that apartment. I didn't oh, know that. Right. I just saw a guy trying to beat the hell out of a woman. Yeah, sometimes you'll break up a fight and uh, try to help out the lady, and then she's on your back pulling you off. Well, you know, it's funny you asked. Like the last time I used the martial arts, I was talking to a Kempo grandmaster a couple of weeks ago, and when you were when you would achieve a certain skill level in any of the martial arts, particularly the black belt and above, there's a certain inner confidence that comes with that. And those types of people tend to not get messed with. Right. Pretty much because we're not in situations where we're gonna get messed in with. If I'm walking around and I see something odd going on, I'm just gonna turn around and go the other way. And I really believe that people that are really, really, really good at something, they kind of exude a special air you know, everyone's making a big deal about, oh, anti-bully, anti-bully, anti-bully. And I tell the parents that come to our school, no, you don't need to teach an anti-bully course. You teach your child how to be more confident. Right. Confident people don't get picked on. So that's kind of the essence of martial arts is developing your body, developing your mind, and forging your spirit. And you never have to use the martial arts. You should not be in a situation where you do. So right now, who's the best pound-for-pound -pound fighter in the world in your book? You know what? I, I had a feeling you were going to ask me that. I wasn't a fan of his at first. I would say Anderson. I, I really had doubts about him early in his career. And I'm not talking about when he fought Chris Liebman. He had become the champion and had already won several defenses. But I just think Anderson is at a completely different level than most fighters. He's just, he's at matrix level. 
You know, when he knocked Forrest Griffin out with a jab, I think Anderson was moving backwards and he knocked Forrest Griffin out. Yeah, I think Anderson is the, the guy right now, probably followed by, I would say, GSP. But I think there are, there's subtle differences between the two. I think GSP's fighting child, style has changed a lot. And, you know, Anderson is still finishing guys and brutally. Let me ask you a question. This is uh, becoming a popular debate. Ben Askren versus GSP. How do you see that going? If it ever happened. You know, I... Chris's wrestling coach, Mike Malinconico from Rhino Wrestling Club, of course, he's well plugged into that community. And Askren's wrestling is at a different level. He has the, he does this thing called funk style. And, uh, you know, my understanding of funk wrestling is it's just a lot of weird and unorthodox positions that you just have an intuitive understanding of how to move in. It can't be taught. For instance, I was watching uh, Ashkin in one of his Bellator, I, it may have been one of his title defenses, he shot a double on a guy and his hips were way out from underneath him, not typically a position that you can finish a takedown in because you, you know, you're flattened out. He's just got that ability to get his hips back underneath you and get you down. So I think, you know, um, when when uh, Askren fought Amasu, you know, Amasu's game plan was is to stay away and just light Askren up. And that, uh, that's all well and good until Askren literally gets his hands on you. He's like Velcro. So if Askren was to fight GSP, I tell you, I'm a uh, pathological root for the underdog type person. I think overall the fight would favor GSP. I think he's probably an overall much better athlete than Askren, but I think I don't know that GSP would be able to deal with uh, Askren uh, once Askren takes him down. I know you're not a big fan of Askren. I see a lot of your stuff up. Uh, <laughs> he's not the most exciting fighter. His game plan is to get you down. But you know, Mike, I got to say, I think his striking is really coming along. If his ground and pound um, keeps coming up, uh, the way he holds people down, I mean, you're literally going to be target practice for three rounds or until the ref pulls him off you. So uh, I uh, I thought he was really boring in the beginning of his career where he would just hold on to guys and win by points. But um, uh, his last fight, he grounded and pounded somebody's face into a bloody pulp. Was that Amasu last fight? Yeah. Yeah, yeah see, and you, you also have to remember when you look at guys like Daniel Cormier, these are, I mean, Ashkin, like, they're at Olympic level. Right. These are not normal athletes. And then when you look at the microcosm of the UFC, like a lot of the fans will say, and, and this is why I say just MMA fans in general are stupid. Uh, this guy, he's a bum. There are no fighters in the UFC that are bums. You're talking about the 300 or 250, 275 best fighters in the world. You could be ranked last in the UFC. You're still better than 9,985,000 of the <laughs> other fighters that are out there. You're one of the 300 motherfuckers that made it to the best in the world. So there's no bad fighters in the UFC. So I think uh, Ashgren takes GSP down and, and manhandles him. Yeah, I, I don't see GSP being able to stop him, but GSP is at a different level. I would put him right behind uh, Anderson as far as pound for pound. Uh, everyone says he's the best wrestler in uh, MMA, but you don't see him representing Canada in the Olympics. You know, I had actually heard he he uh, he was going to try out for the Canadian Olympic wrestling team. I've heard through wrestling sources that his wrestling is that good. Well, it's at Olympic level. Can you tell me a couple guys locally that uh, you've seen, whether you're affiliated with them or not, uh, on the local circuit that you think could one day uh, reach that UFC plateau? Yeah, you know what, Mike, uh, I always like to say I call the shots the way I see them. I pretty much get along with everyone in the MMA community. I don't want to be that guy that's got beefs going on. Jason Sargas has got Paul Felder. Paul Felder is super legit. I believe he's at 5-0, and yeah. he had a huge test with Corey Bleak. And let me tell you something, you sign on to fight anyone from AMA Fight Club, you're taking on a well-trained, well-rounded fighter who's training with the best guys in the world. Felder went to a decision with him, which is which that was a huge win. Mm -hmm. So in my opinion, I, you know, I think early in his career, Felder had guys that he was just way, way better than then. That's not Paul's fault. It's not a, an athlete's responsibility to fight down to the level of his or her competition. So Felder is definitely legit. At 5-0, and oh, I don't know what uh, Jason Sargas's plans are. I listened to the interview. I, did he mention World Series of Fighting? Or, yeah, that's uh, yeah. Where, where he wants to take, take his guys yeah. until uh, possibly... Or, or the UFC. 
you know, um, I think the UFC is kind of in a talent crunch right now, you know, so it might be a good time to try to get, what weight is Felder? Is he a 45 pounder or a lightweight? Uh, I'm not exactly sure, and I just watched the fight too. I watched the whole yeah. fight. I'll, I'll guess and say he's a 55 pounder. I don't think he's a 45 pounder. So you figure Felder at 5 and 0, oh, he gets a couple of more wins, maybe two or three wins. He's probably knocking at the door. Then you have um, Jesus Martinez and Will Martinez. Those are two guys. I mean, everybody knows the history of, of us and the Martinez's. Chris. Chris was 2-0 and when he fought Jesus at 6-0, and and uh, Jesus knocked him out. And I've become really, really friendly with those guys. I go and I train at their gym. Um, I really have a lot of respect for the Martinez brothers because not only are they, they, they te they're technical, but they just have that fighting spirit. Those two brothers, yeah. they don't give a shit. <laughs> they like to bang. They'll, they'll fight you in your garage. They don't care. And then when you back that up with talent, so we're not just talking two thugs that will just roll in with baseball bats and beat the hell out of you. These guys are technical. Jesus was fighting Taiwan Howard, who's a real local tough guy. I mean, uh, Taiwan Howard's got, I don't know, 16, 17 pro fights. He knocks Jesus down, I don't know, early in the first round. Listen, you don't get knocked down because it wasn't a hard punch. You get knocked down because you're fucked up. From his back, Jesus submits Taiwan. I mean, they're they're really good. Will Martinez, he every fight he has in Bellator, he's looking better and better. Uh, he's just a beast. Those two guys, you know, and they have a really good bunch of guys they're training with now. So those are the three guys off the top of my mind that I would say locally, to definitely keep your mind on, uh, eye on. That'd be Paul Felder, Jesus Martinez, and Will Martinez. If I'm not mistaken, Jesus has got a fight uh, scheduled. And I do I do want to challenge Jesus to a uh, all-you-can-eat contest because he told me between fights he likes to eat, and I don't think he can eat as much as I can. So when he's done with that fight, I'd like to see. He says, yeah, his mom will cook the food. We've all actually talked about it. I'd like to sit down to a, to a Spanish rice eating contest with Jesus, but they're, they're really <laughs> tough, tough guys. Those are the top three. And then you have, um, you know, you got some guys that have done really well. And then, uh, you know, Timmy Carpenter, Timmy Williams, those guys are really good. There's a lot of tough guys at Balance. Uh, Balance has got a really, really good good fight team down there. Just guys that are training hard all the time. So a lot of good, I, I think um, Philly is really shaping up as being one of the best areas in the Northeast as far as an epicenter of quality fighters. There really are. And it has to do, I think, with those little fly-by-night MMA schools blow, blow, you know, drying up and, and going away. Because if you're if you're Joe Smith and you're just fielding a bunch of mediocre amateurs, business-wise, how are you supposed to compete with a, a Martinez BJJ or Brazen Boxing or Balance? Those are legitimate martial arts schools training, uh, you know, really really good students. Who's the best Ami? I got. I think uh, Sabatini. What's he? Uh, Twelve and one Ami. I believe Pat is eleven and one, and it's interesting because I, uh, Jason Sargas, if you're listening, I want to interview Pat for the blog. And what I find interesting about Sabatini is he's been um, under tremendous pressure to turn pro, but his family insisted that he graduate from college. So he just graduated Ryder University. The kid's got a four-year college degree. See now that is an act. see now when Pat fights, he can fight because he likes it. Mm -hmm. There's no economic imperative. I have to win. I have to win. And I think that economic imperative is what causes a lot of fighters to underperform. Oh my God, I have to win. Oh my God, I have to win. I you know I have to. Pat's got a college education. I don't know what his major is, but he can oh, he's got that education to fall back on. He's he's an absolute he's one of Tom McGonagall's early students as yeah. well. You know, and Pat Sabatini is a super respectful kid, tough as tough as nails. You know, and he's you know, he's in good hands with Jason Sargas. I'm sure Jason will bring him up, uh, you know, get him the fights that he needs at the right time. But yeah, for sure Sabatini is the one amateur that comes to mind, the an absolute wrecking machine. They call him the uh, the Iron Man. Pat's uh he's gonna be a monster and I heard that uh, he might be uh, thinking about turning pro now. Uh, may have some deal worked out with his dad. We'll have to get him on the show and talk to him about that. 
All right, so Jim Wing, thanks for coming on the show. A lot of interesting things. If you want to train with Jim Wing, check out wingsma.com. Also, check out Wings Daily News for some very interesting insight into MMA, fitness, and life. Anything you want to plug, Jim? Yeah, I'll plug shamelessly, Mike. Uh, I want to give a plug for my son, Chris Wing, who does Redline Athletics Nutrition Compounds. What Chris does is set you up with custom meal plans if you're fitness challenged or weight challenged. He'll really, really whip you into shape. He's got, he got my daughter in incredible shape for uh, her Vegas trip. And I also wanted to, uh, if you guys go to lo- um, supportlocalstuff.com forward slash mountain climb, you can find my fundraising campaign for my Mount Shuxon mountain climb. I'd really appreciate any, any you know, anything, five, ten dollars, twenty dollars. It'll help me uh, fund the expedition. You can, um, I blog generally new content on my uh, blog site every day. That's uh, wingsdailynews.com, Twitter, at Alpine Fit. And uh, I want to really thank you, Mike. I'm really quite flattered considering the, uh, the caliber of the guests that you've had in here, Jason Sargos, Jimmy Benz. I, I'm really flattered that you would have me come in here and uh, give me the opportunity to speak. Anytime, my friend. This has been The Sit Down, Jim Wing, and we'll see you next week.